Good evening and welcome to this third uh, live event hosted by the chemistry department at Rugby School. Thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight uh, we have the privilege of being joined by Professor Ross Hatton from the University of Warwick uh, and today he will be giving us a online lecture on the subject of renewable energy and solar energy, uh, which is an area in which he is an active researcher. I hope you enjoy it. It's now a great privilege to welcome Professor Ross Hatton. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ross Hatton. I'm from the Department of Chemistry in the University of Warwick, which is, uh, as you can see on the slide there on the right hand side, is right in the in, right in the middle of this um, beautiful green island of ours. And I'm going to have a, I have a particular interest in uh, materials for energy applications. Now, over the next few decades, there's going to be a transformation in the way that we uh, produce energy and we, the way we use energy. Um, and that's going to be uh, present fantastic opportunity for chemists to make contributions uh, to the various um, enabling areas for that. So why is there going to be this uh, transformation? Well, first of all, let's consider energy demand. So if, I, if you look at this graph that we've got at the moment, this is a plot of on the y-axis, energy consumption per capita versus gross domestic product per capita. So per capita means per person in the population. And what you can see is for the countries uh, represented here, there's a clear correlation between uh, economic wealth and the consumption, the energy consumption per capita. So people in uh, people who live in countries that are more economically wealthy, use more energy. Now, if you look down the bottom left hand corner of this graph, the world's two most populous nations, China and India, who together have a combined population, a third of the world. Um, they're down here in the bottom left. OK, and in the coming decades, they are going to uh, move the, a, a very large proportion of their populations are going to move up this energy ladder so that they will be in a few decades, up at the same energy consumption level as the EU and Japan. OK, and so that's because of their very large populations is going to mean that there's going to be a very large uh, increase in the demand for energy. At the same time, the world's population is increasing. So even since the decade that I was born in, which is the 70s, the world population has doubled, approximately doubled to 7.5 billion people. Okay. And in the next 10 years, it's going to increase by another thousand billion, a thousand million. And after that, up to 2050, another thousand million. OK, and all those people um, are going to need access to energy in order to have um, a high standard or a good standard of living. So let's look again at um, the case of China and India and think about their economic growth. So if we look in the last five years, these um, nations of their economies have grown by six to seven percent on average. So if they continue to grow at that rate, what that means is in 10 years time, not far away, the Chinese economy will be twice as big and the Indian economy will be twice as big. Okay, it's only 10 years and that is going to require a huge amount of energy to make that transition. And so we understand then why the demand is going to increase. Now at the moment um, we generate about 85% of all of our energy um, by burning fossil fuels. So we burn methane gas, um, cook our food, and also to heat our homes. And we burn alkanes, hydrocarbon in the form of oil to uh, in our uh, internal combustion engine so that we can move around. And we burn oil and gas 
in our power stations to generate electricity. So why don't we just keep doing this? Well, we've got plenty of coal and there's no shortage of natural gas in the ground. And we've got about 100 years worth of oil remaining. So why don't we just meet energy demand by burning these fossil fuels? Well, when we burn fossil fuels, uh, we get lots of heat, which is good, but we also get a gas called carbon dioxide. So the carbon, these molecules with a lot of carbon in them, react with oxygen in the air and they form carbon dioxide. And there's a graph here that shows um, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere as a function of years since last 10,000 years since the last ice age. And what we see is that there is a sharp spike around about the time of the Industrial Revolution, is when it kicks off. And we go up from about 275 parts per million right up to, right, well, this data is a little bit out of date, so let's correct the graph. So let's bring the latest data in, right up to 415 parts per million uh, last year. Okay, and this carbon is, so, is man-made. This is carbon produced by the combustion of fossil fuels. So why is this a problem? What's the problem with carbon dioxide? Well, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, okay? So all the time, sun is irradiating the surface of the earth um, and that the sun is, the earth is taking in that heat. And if the earth is to remain at a constant temperature, it then has to re-emit that energy back off into space. So it takes in the visible uh, energy, visible light, but also we get a lot of infrared light from the sun. And all that's absorbed by the earth. And the earth, because it's much cooler than the, than the sun, re-emits that radiation at a much longer wavelength. But we can't see it, and it's re-emitting um, in, in the, in the mid uh, infrared. Now, ordinarily, that energy is dissipated off into space. But it turns out that carbon dioxide can be uh, excited by this radiation. It can be vibrationally excited. So let's look at our carbon dioxide molecule then. It's a carbon atom with two oxygen atoms. And it can be vibrationally excited in three ways. We can have a a, an asymmetric uh, stretching vibration, which is the top one. We can have a symmetric stretching vibration. And then down the bottom here, we have this bending mode. Okay. And it turns out that this bending mode is excited at a frequency that is matches the, uh, the frequency at which uh, infrared emission from the surface of the Earth is most intense. So the infrared radiation is trying to leave the atmosphere and go off into space and on its way it meets these carbon dioxide molecules and it excites these vibrational modes. Now, the carbon dioxide molecules then relax back down to the ground state by re-emitting that radiation that they've absorbed, but they re-emit it in all directions. So they re-emit it isotropically. So some of that heat comes back towards the surface of the Earth. And in this way, carbon dioxide is serving as a, as a blanket, trapping some of the heat that would ordinarily leave. Okay. And so um, the Earth is warming up, the surface of the Earth is warming up. Now, when we think about the atmosphere, it's important to remember that the atmosphere is all around us. And if you get in an aeroplane and, and fly, the, the, Photograph in the top right hand corner here is a photograph from a flight I took a few years ago. There we see it, the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is all around us and it's something very tangible. Now, so we're taking this man made carbon dioxide and we are warming the surface of the earth. This gas is, is, is functioning as a greenhouse gas. And that's resulting in global warming, and that global warming is resulting in a change of the climate. So we go from the emission of carbon dioxide all the way down to 
final result is a change in our climate. So, how is it changing the climate? Let's think about this. So, so far, since before the Industrial Revolution, the temperature has now increased. Mean average surface temperature is increased by one degree. Doesn't seem like very much, but what we have seen is increased frequency of heat waves over most populated areas in the world. Okay? And these are most intense in cities. Now, at the moment, 55% of the world's population live in cities, but by 2050, more like 70% of the world's population live in cities. And this is a good thing. It is on the whole, environmental, from an environmental point of view, better that people live in cities than in the countryside. Um, however, these cities are hot spots when it comes to heat waves because the materials that we use for buildings absorb a lot of the sun's energy and then are re-emitting it. And also there's very little vegetation. Vegetation helps to uh, cool the surrounding environment because of the process of evaporation from the surface of the leaves. Of course, in cities, there's not much vegetation. And so in a heat wave, a city, centre of a city can be several degrees, four, five degrees higher than in the surrounding countryside. And we all know, of course, that um, uh, very high temperatures, these heat, heat waves can be uh, very dangerous, uh, particularly for uh, vulnerable people and elderly people. Now, this year in May, so last month, was the hottest May um, recorded in, in, since records began. Okay, the only other actually was on the equal at a par with the 2016, and that was globally. It turned out to be the driest May on record in the UK. Okay, so it's very much here and now. Another effect that we've seen is an increased frequency of heavy precipitation events. Now, cities are rarely designed to deal with large volumes of water. So when we have a lot of intense rain, then we have flooding in cities and they have that results in, in, in very large insurance bills. And of course it brings what's in the sewers up onto the streets, which creates a, um, a, a, a health risk. Now in February in the UK, so still this year, we recorded our wettest February on record. So February, we have our wettest record, uh, re our wettest February in the UK. And then in May, we have our driest May. And these types of fluctuations in the, in, in the uh, climate are having an impact on food production. Okay, so the cost of food goes up when we have these types of, of, of um, fluctuations um, in, in, in the environment. Now, okay, let's keep to considering this climate change effect. So one degree increase in temperature. So where does all this carbon dioxide go? Well, half of it is dissolved in the ocean to form carbonic acid. Now, the ocean, if we look at the pH of the ocean, so the acidity of the ocean, a measure of the hydro the proton concentration the hydrogen ion concentration is alkaline so all the life in the ocean has grown and developed in this alkaline environment and we are introducing an acid we are changing the ph the c is becoming increasingly less alkaline and currently the uh, the hydrogen ion concentration it's about 30% higher than what it was in pre-industrial times. And by 2050, we're gonna be up at 70% higher. And perturbing this complex uh, um, ecological system in such a way obviously has fairly dramatic um, detrimental effects. And one of these is um, the effect on uh, uh, coral reefs. Now the photograph on the left hand side is actually a photograph of me. I'm standing on the, uh, the bottom of a reef um, when I was a, a younger a younger man, something I really enjoyed doing. Um, and 
I, I was lucky enough to see beautiful things like in the center central photograph here. But in the 20 years since, there has been catastrophic loss of the reefs, the coral reefs all around the world. OK, and that is due to the change in the acidity and it's due to the rise in temperature in the seawater. Um, and it's a clear indicator of uh, what is to come if we continue to, if the, uh, the pH of the oceans continues to change. <clears throat> so, what else do we have to worry about associated with climate change? Well, positive feedback mechanisms. So we all know that the ice is melting, the world gets warmer, the ice melts, that makes, it's pretty logical. So the, the ice that's on the land, as that melts, that's um, causing the sea levels to rise. But the main reason the sea levels are rising is because the volume, the density of the water is changing with temperature. So this is the density of the water in all of the oceans and it's occupying a greater volume. Its density is going down. Okay. Um, and as the polar regions uh, melt, of course, the sea level is rising as the as the ocean, uh, the um, the density of the water is changing, the ocean is rising. And for the 600 million people who live on low lying coastal areas, this is a this is a, a, a real concern. But this is not the only problem. 35 million people in the world live in the permanent um, permafrost zone, permafrost zone. So that's where the ground is permanently frozen. This is in northern uh, Canada and northern Russia. It's whole cities built on this frozen ground, which is gradually defrosting, okay, undermining the very foundations of those places. But that's not all. The, earth, the, 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 the ice caps actually serve as great reflectors for sunlight. Okay, so light, they reflect a lot of the light that's instant on the surface of the earth at the poles. So as the, the ice caps get smaller and smaller, then more and more energy is being absorbed. By, where, where there was an ice cap, now there isn't. And so that energy is being absorbed, which is accelerating the process. But still, that's not all. In the frozen ground in the northern part of um, and the southern, in, in, in the northern part of, of the world, in, around the North Pole, and in, in the um, in the Siberia, in Siberia, which is northern Russia, there is an area um, around about the size of Europe uh, that is frozen, solid, and gradually defrosting. And trapped in that solid ground, that frozen ground, is a mega pool, a vast uh, amount of methane. Methane is a very, very potent greenhouse gas, much more potent than carbon dioxide. And it's these methane molecules are trapped in a cage of water. But as that water defrosts, the methane is coming out in an uncontrolled way. Okay, so we're seeing some positive feedback mechanisms here, which are accelerating the rate of uh, global warming. We need we, we we can't be sure exactly how the how quickly these things um, will ex will bring about accelerated changes, but it's certainly not good. So, in view of all these things, um, spurred by uh, worries about this, um, 190 countries all around the world, but actually that's most of the countries in the world, gathered in Paris in 2015 and agreed that we need to try and control carbon dioxide and gas emissions so that we can control global warming and so in turn control climate change. And this graph really encapsulates um, the size of the challenge here. So. What we have, this is produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. What we see, which is, a, which is basically they have taken um, the data, a panel of scientists have taken the data from climate scientists studying climate change all around the world and 
um, drawn it together to plot this data set and then have worked with climate scientists all around the world to decide on what is the likely trajectory, um, what are the different possible scenarios in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and um, the consequent uh, global warming. So on the y-axis, we have global greenhouse gas emissions, and on the x-axis, we have years. And so um, if you are an A-level student now, um, you will, if you live in the UK, you, you have the life ex expectancy statistics as such, so there's a very good chance that you're going to live until the end of this century. And certainly your children will live well beyond the end of the century. So um, this time frame is very relevant to you. Right, what you'll see is the black curve is the historical uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, and actually, if we move over to 2020, we are currently around about here. So, we can follow the red line. Now, it was agreed that what we need to do is we need to, um, climate scientists have agreed this, that as the consensus amongst climate scientists is that if we can um, keep the mean surface temperature of the earth at the end of the century below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Now we're already at one. If we can keep it below 1.5 degrees, then we can avoid um, uh, potentially catastrophic changes to our climate. Okay. And certainly changes to our climate above that, the changes to our climate will be so severe that it would be difficult to sustain such a large global population. So this is a really serious thing. Now, in order to do that, we need to be on the green trajectory. OK. Now, let's look carefully at that. What that means is by 2030, we need to have reduced our carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. I, I say those interchangeably. Carbon dioxide is the, is, is the main greenhouse gas. There are others that are important, but we're focusing on carbon dioxide here because it's um, the result of burning fossil fuels. Um, we need to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 50% in the next 10 years. Okay. And then by the middle of the century, which is only 30 years away, we need to be carbon neutral. So we need to have reduced our net emissions to zero. OK, and then beyond then, we need to be extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we have to do all that if we're going to ensure that we keep uh, the temperature below 1.5 degrees at the end of the century. So, just looking at that very quickly, that's pretty, uh, that's an enormous challenge, of course. But if we think about the far end of this curve, actually extracting carbon dioxide as chemists, we will know that we could take carbon dioxide and we could reduce it to form uh, quite a number of um, uh, useful feedstock molecules for the pharmaceutical industry and the chemical industry. So ethene, formic acid, ethanol, uh, methane. So this chemists are actively looking at ways of making this process efficient for this uh, reason. So how are we going to do this? Well, the UK was the first um, major industrialized nation to commit to zero carbon, to, to a net zero carbon um, by 2050, so in 30 years time. And if you're interested in, in how we can do that, I'll point you to this report here, which is actually, I've read the report, and it's, it's um, fairly easy to read, not too hard going, um, unlike some government reports, um, and it, it's actually very interesting to read. Okay. And it explains what we need to do, and it shows that it, it is actually possible for our country. <clears throat> so what we're going to need to do, we're going to have to replace uh, methane, so the methane we use to heat our homes and cook our food, we're going to have to stop using that altogether. And we're going to have to replace it. With what we're going to do, we could replace some of it with biogas, which is still methane, 
but it's methane formed from the decomposition of organic matter, where that organic matter has come from plants which have grown relatively recently. So the plants take in carbon dioxide when they grow, and then the biogas that's generated from their decomposition, when that burns, that produces the same amount of carbon dioxide. So they are carbon neutral, that's a carbon neutral process. However, there's a fairly, it's only, you can only use a, that to a certain extent, fairly small amount of this biogas. And that's because of course, we really want to be growing crops um, to eat them rather than to convert them to energy. Um, and there simply wouldn't be enough supply to meet demand. So what we're we going to do? Well, we need to transition our gas system to hydrogen. Now, hydrogen's wonderful. It's the most abundant element uh, in the universe. And it has an energy density of almost three times that of petroleum. So a lot of energy packed into those hydrogen bonds, those, those that's hydrogen, the, the bonds, the, the bond in the hydrogen molecule, not a hydrogen bond, that's a different thing, of course. So, of course, where are we going to get all this hydrogen from? Well, we've got hydrogen as an element in abundance in the presence of water. But where are we going to get it from? Well, we can split hydrogen, water, into hydrogen and oxygen. And chemists are very actively researching this area. They're very interested in using a process called electrolysis, which is essentially we pass a a direct current through water and oxygen it bubbles off one electrode and um, hydrogen the other. And we can have catalysts on the electrodes um, in order to minimize the electrical energy we need to put in to generate those gases. Of course, in a zero carbon environment, in order to make that zero carbon, we'd have to ensure that the electricity that was used, used to split the water was generated from renewable source. A smarter way to do it is photocatalytically. So that's actually to use sunlight, the energy in the photons of light to split the water into hydrogen and oxygen. And again, chemists are very active in the development of catalysts for that process. And actually the solar resource is absolutely enormous. We, we, we receive in one hour enough energy from the sun to meet all of our needs uh, for a year. Okay, for all of our energy needs, both electricity and heat for a year. So that's a, that's a, a very abundant renewable source that we need to be able to tap into. And of course, once we've made our, um, our hydrogen, we need to be able to store it. We need to be able to be able to, once it's stored, be able to get it back out quickly. And chemists are very interested in developing uh, materials that have got a very high surface to volume ratios, um, and porous materials called zeolites and metal organic frameworks. This is an example of a metal organic framework that was developed at, at Warwick University by one of my colleagues. And we can use these to store the hydrogen molecules. The hydrogen goes in through these pores and is absorbed to the inside of these cavities. When we want the hydrogen back out, we warm up the framework and the hydrogen comes out. So this is a very active area of research, uh, not only actually for the storage of hydrogen, but also for the storage of uh, carbon dioxide, trapping carbon dioxide, um, and other gases. So chemists have a really important role to play in the development of ways to generate hydrogen from water. What about um, petrol, what about beyond petroleum? So how are we going to get around that? Well, the future is electric. OK, certainly electric for uh, small cut for cars. Okay. Um, now, uh, of course, at the heart of a, an electric car is a battery. And chemists have a critically important role. They're developing materials at the moment, all kinds of different materials. Um, to ensure that we can get the necessary power and lifetime from the batteries. One material that's attracted a lot of attention actually for battery applications is graphene, which is a remarkable material. Graphene is a single layer of atoms 
And when you have multiple layers of graphene, the, um, uh, the metal ions that move around in a battery in order to deliver the electrical energy um, can intercalate between the graphene sheets. So graphene is particularly good because these small uh, metal ions, lithium most often, can intercalate between these sheets. So there's a huge amount of massive research effort in the area of developing battery technology. I can say actually I, I have a, an electric car um, and I've um, actually one of these cars in the, in the picture here um, and my car can do 180 miles um, between recharges. Right, for heavy duty vehicles, the battery, batteries won't work because they'll be too heavy. Okay, so for an articulated lorry, you'd need so much of the space taken up by the battery, it wouldn't be viable. So what we would use instead is a thing called a, a fuel cell. Now, a fuel cell takes hydrogen and oxygen and combines the two of them to make electricity. So this is the opposite process to the electrolysis. And this process is uh, really very efficient. It's about 60% efficient. So you can take the hydrogen, you can generate electricity on board the lorry, and that electricity can then be used to drive an electric motor. Now, electric motors are really very efficient at taking um, electrical energy and converting it to kinetic energy, 90% or more. And what that means is when you couple an electric motor with a, a fuel cell, then you've got a, a device there that will uh, allow you to convert the chemical energy in the bonds of the hydrogen and the oxygen to kinetic energy with an efficiency of 54%, which is twice the efficiency with which uh, energies, chemical energy is converted to kinetic energy in an internal combustion engine. So fuel cells are um, particularly important for heavy duty vehicles and, and maybe also for uh, cars. So the future of transportation is electric and hydrogen powered. What about coal? Well, coal and gas are burned in our power stations um, to generate electricity. What's the alternative? Well, the future of that is, of course, renewables combined with um, uh, nuclear power. We need to have a portfolio okay, of different um, distributed energy sources feeding into a distributed grid, much less centralized than it currently is. <clears throat> and actually in the UK, the transition to wind as a sort of form of um, electricity generation has been extremely rapid. Okay? So in uh, 2010, 40% of all of our electricity was generated by coal and 3% by renewables. And now in 2020, within the last two months, we've not generated any electricity from coal. And typically it's down at the one or two percent level. So how much energy, we, energy do we now generate from renewables? So if you've got a mobile phone near you, I've got one just here, I'd like you to click on to uh, gridwatch.co.uk and we can have a look in real time at how much electricity is currently being generated by renewable sources in the UK. So, gridwatch.co.uk. <clears throat> I look there now, I can see, right, okay, at the moment in the United Kingdom, a few minutes ago, we were generating 21% of our electricity uh, from renewable sources. 15% from nuclear and 2% from coal. Okay. And actually, you can, um, renewables in the UK can generate up to 35% of all our electricity. And in recent weeks, that has frequently been the case. So that has been a staggering growth in the. In, um, increase in the in the rate with which we've been able to implement renewable technologies. Nobody would have thought that 10 years ago that that would have been possible. 
So we've made great progress with that. And chemists have a critical role to play in the development of um, lightweight um, materials for uh, the turbines and for the towers uh, for the wind turbine, for the, for the offshore wind and onshore wind turbines. The materials chemists have played a critical role in the development and continue to do so. The other um, technology that's particularly important, and it's something that's particularly close to my heart, is photovoltaics. So these are devices that take sunlight and generate electricity directly without any moving parts, without any emissions, without any noise. And that cannot be said for any other means of electricity generation. Okay. <clears throat> so what about solar? What about this viability? Well, we know that around the world now, in many places in the world, the cost of electricity generated from large scale solar farms is at or below the cost of generating electricity from a conventional coal fire power station. Again, 10 years ago, we would never thought that, that was possible. But what about the UK? Well, a few days ago, the UK government signed off um, the UK's largest solar park, which is going to be built down in Kent. It's going to supply 91,000 homes with electricity at maximum capacity. So actually, solar is suitable for the UK. Well, why is that? Well, in the southern part of the UK, we get a solar resource, at the same kind of light levels as Central Europe. But we have an advantage, and the advantage is, is it's cooler. And that's important because the efficiency with which solar cells, conventional solar cells, which are based on a semiconductor of silicon, decreases. Uh, when they get warmer. So ideally, you want them to be kept cool. Um, so we get the same solar resource as Central Europe on our uh, southernmost coast, but it's cooler. And as a result, um, that part of the United Kingdom is particularly well suited to photovoltaics. Right, in very uh, warm, uh, very arid environments or environments where things get a bit too hot, of course, there's a motivation then to try and cool your solar cells. And increasingly, people are combining photovoltaics with um, agriculture. So it's a trend called agrovoltaics. Okay. Um, and actually what's happening here is that we grow a crop underneath in the shade of the photovoltaic device. And the advantage here is mutually beneficial for both parties, because first of all, the plant is partially shaded um, and so is, is protected from the most intense uh, light in the middle of the day. And the photovoltaic device is cooled by the uh, evaporation of water from the leaves of the plant as it moves up and condenses on the back of the photovoltaic device. Okay. So the water that condenses on the back of the solar cell then re-evaporates and in doing so cools the solar cell. So this is a rapidly growing uh, way of combining uh, of, 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 of combining making food with clean energy. And already solar cells um, employed in this context power and about 1.5 million homes across the globe, particularly in, in, in Japan, where um, agricultural land is at a premium. So silicon solar cells, most 90% of all solar cells that you see or photovoltaics that you see on the roofs of people's houses are made from silicon. That's, a, that's the same element that's used um, in your uh, silicon chip to drive your computers, except the difference being the purity. Silicon used in a solar cell is, is typically and not as pure. Right, the reason that photovoltaics have become so much more widely used and the cost has come down is because the cost per module of these things has dropped in an astronomically quickly. Okay, so now we're at a point where the, I've got a sign saying low, um, quality signal. OK, 
Okay, I'll keep going anyway. Um, so we're at a point now where, as I say, in many parts of the world, the cost of generating electricity from photovoltaics is lower than the cost of generating electricity from the coal fire power station. And that is because of this dramatic drop in the cost of the module. However, silicon photovoltaics can't be used for all types of applications because they're heavy and they're only one color and they're rigid. And so there is room for alternative types of photovoltaics that can meet the needs of transportation and buildings applications, um, such as semi-transparent um, glass that can actually harvest light, but also can be seen through. You can see that in the bottom left-hand picture here. Flexible solar cells for consumer electronics. So this is a, a flexible solar cell. Okay. And flexible solar cells for integration into the roofs of your car. So there is space for other types of photovoltaics. One class that's particularly exciting, which is the example I've just shown you, is based on organic semiconductors. So what we do is we take out silicon and we replace it with organic molecules. Okay, and so the organic molecules that do the absorption of the light and the generation of the electricity. So when we think about um, organic, when we hear that word organic, we typically think of living things. Okay, but in the context of chemistry, what we mean is carbon-based molecules. And if we were to look, for example, at a leaf as a living thing, the reason it's green is because of this molecule chlorophyll. And this is actually a, a class of um, organic semiconductor because it's made up primarily of carbon and it's highly conjugated, lots of double bonds there. Okay. As an example of an organic semiconductor, um, similar molecules can be used in the context of an organic photovoltaic device to generate electricity. On the right hand side here, we have another one, tetracine. So this is another example. Um, you may feel that you've never seen, had it, known about tetracine before, maybe it's bright orange, but if you've ever eaten a flame grilled beef burger, then you will have eaten some tetracine because it's formed um, in the char. Or if you've ever stood behind a bus when it moves off, a diesel bus, and breathed in some of the fumes, you'll have breathed in tetracine. Now, I wouldn't recommend that you do that, um, but nonetheless, it's a, a, it's a known molecule, well-known molecule, that exhibits semiconducting properties. It's a, an organic semiconductor. And we can use these molecules and other types of conjugated molecules to absorb light and to generate electricity in the context of an organic photovoltaic. Now, these types of semiconductors have huge advantages over conventional semiconductors in that they are made of earth abundant elements, um, they are cheap non-toxic elements. Chemists can design these molecules to manipulate their energy levels and design them to match the application, you change the color. And also they can be printed to make them roll to roll processable. Printing means you can make something roll to roll processing, that means you can print it quickly, you can print it quickly, it will be a low cost. So this is, in this example that I've shown you, this is an organic solar cell. And you can see straight away, this is what the advantage would be as compared to a conventional, rigid, heavy solar cell. So what's going on in here? Well, in an organic solar cell, we have the heart of the cell is two different types of molecules. When the light comes in, one of the molecules is excited, an electron is excited from the ground to an excited state, and then, the electron moves over to the other molecule extremely quickly, okay? one millionth of a millionth of a second. Okay, that process of electron transfer occurs. And once we've separated the electron from taking that electron from one molecule and putting it onto the other, then we've performed the most the key process for the photovoltaic. And chemists do a lot of work in um, developing, trying to develop combinations of molecules that allow us to control this process of charge transfer and to ensure that the charge transfer state is very long lived. 
Lots of really exciting chemistry there. So, as it happens, organic flat screen displays are already with us. So you can go in, I went into my local shop, my local electronics store recently took this photograph. This is a, a large flat screen television, it's OLED TV. The O stands for organic. So it's an organic light emitting diode. So the bit, the semiconductor component in this device, in making up, emitting the light and transporting the charges is a highly conjugated organic molecule. So if we already have these for televisions, why don't we have them for photovoltaics? A, a television takes electricity and generates light. Surely it's just the inverse. You could take light and make electricity using the same technology. Well, we can learn a lot from mm. display technology, but the requirements for a photovoltaic device are much more uh, severe. So for a photovoltaic device, you wanted to sit on the roof of your house or on the roof of your car and to perform for a decade or several decades um, without a major loss in performance. Whereas your television, you put on the wall and you have for a year or two or three or four years even, but it's in the comfortable environment of your home. Okay. So a lot of research at the moment for in the area of organic photovoltaics is really focused on how we can improve the stability of the semiconductors in order to achieve the longevity that's needed for uh, solar applications. Interestingly, when we think about a silicon solar cell, they are now sold with guarantees of 30 years. There's not many things that you can buy in a shop where you go and say, by the way, I want a 30 year guarantee. And that's what's expected. For photovoltaic. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, the, the, the transition in energy that we are, you know, this exciting time has occurred largely because we need to um, meet the needs of, 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 of a growing global population whilst at the same time uh, tackling climate change. And the question is then is government intervention? Yeah. and the technology that we've discussed enough is it going to be enough to actually ensure that we can tackle climate change well this is a photograph taken by a man in 70 60 years ago um, on the surface of the moon okay he took that photograph the surface of the earth of the, of the earth in the distance there right we did that 60 years ago so if we can do that, then we can address um, the climate crisis, but but can't just be done by government intervention and technology. We all have to play our part. Okay? We've all contributed to the problem, and so we all need to be part of the solution. It cannot just be palmed off to others. And that's actually the only way that we're going to tackle this crisis. So here are a few tips. Um, I appreciate that most of you are A-level students, so you're not at the stage where you own your own home, but your parents do. Um, and it's important to be informed about what you can easily do to help us move towards a zero um, carbon society. Well, the very easiest thing and simplest thing to do is you can switch electricity and gas supplier to a green tariff. This takes no more than about five minutes. Okay, um, And we can switch over to um, that. So at the moment I pay about £1.50 a week more in order to get all my electricity and gas from green suppliers. Very important that we stop throwing away so much food. In the UK we throw about 30% of our food away. It takes a lot of energy to make food and so it's important to consume the food that we buy. And we need to Eat less meat. It's very uh, energy intensive to make to, to make meat. Doesn't mean we don't need to eat any meat, but we certainly need to think about eating less. And there's been fantastic prog progress in the development of meat substitutes. I'm a great meat eater, but I have done some experiments, filed all these different alternatives recently. And again, chemists are playing a critical role in ensuring that our um, meat 
meat less alternatives and taste good. And finally, thing to do to test drive an electric car, because once you do, you want to buy one and the cost of the fuel is one fifth of that of petroleum. So there's a big motivation there. And with that, I'll say thank you for listening. Professor Hatton, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, in particular, what really struck me uh, listening to that talk was uh, that fact about the solar energy, uh, about how in one hour enough solar energy comes to Earth um, to provide us with enough energy for an entire year. I thought that was an absolutely yeah. amazing fact. Um, can I just and say that? Yes, go ahead. The important thing that may, what that means, of course, is that we we you know that means we're getting ten thousand times more energy than we need every year from the sun so we need to it is a great opportunity to harvest that and we don't even need to be that good at it in order to get what we need yeah i mean i, I thought that was an amazing fact uh, and certainly our students and that's something that's uh, that i'm sure will stick with you um so this is obviously the third and final uh lecture in our trilogy of lectures this term um we're obviously outstandingly lucky to have Professor Hatton with us, who is an active researcher in this very field. So you can see how relevant it is, and he is at the cutting edge every day. Uh, and so we're obviously enormously privileged to have him uh, today. Um, so can I just quickly say thank you um, to Mr. Gray uh, and to Mr. Johnson uh, for doing the IT for me and making this whole event possible. Uh, can I thank the audience uh, for joining us? Um, really appreciate it and it really makes it worthwhile. Uh, and finally, uh, Professor Hatton, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for your time preparing for this evening. I can see that PowerPoint has clearly taken you hours to put together. I really appreciate it. Uh, and also thank you for letting us share it on our YouTube channel. And I know there's lots of students who couldn't be with us for the live event who will really appreciate that. Well, thank, so thank you for you. inviting me and um, you know I hope that it's useful for you. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.